so I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to the organizers for inviting me to talk about this. My, um, so my, the, the story of how this came about is, is a little interesting. So in three different papers that I was working on, completely unrelated to each other, and I'll maybe allude to them very briefly in this tutorial, I had to bump up against Fano's inequality. And you know, in, for completely different reasons in each of the three cases. And in the process of trying to grapple with the inequality, I started you know, reading about whatever was known about this inequality you know, on the web and you know, using Mr. Google. And most of what was written out there didn't make any sense to me, so as this often happens. I mean, it was all there, and it was all, and it was all written from a particular, in a particular form, a particular language, from the language of minimax theory, something I'll talk about a little bit today. And it, and it was very hard to understand. So I spent a lot of time struggling with the, the concept and trying to get used to it. And the process, you know, after ranting to a number of people about how you know, the web is completely useless at understanding this thing, I ended up writing a, a little note of my own, a little blog post, in fact. And, uh, and I showed it around to some people, and one thing led to another, and suddenly I'm here giving a tutorial on Fano's inequality, which is another way of saying that I'm, you know, in the, in the, in the mathematical landscape that this lives in, I'm, I'm kind of a tourist a little bit. So, you know, like most tourists, I come and observe things about the local population, all this seems strange to me, and, the, and all the locals say, oh my God, you know, we all know that anyway. But every now and then, you know, the tourist does come up with observations that might be useful and might be different and interesting just because you're a tourist in the country. So, so you should take this tutorial in that spirit that as a, as a computer scientist tourist in the land of Fano's inequality, which is a land of information theory and statistics, I will probably be saying things that many of you already know about and think is completely obvious, but hopefully I will bring an insight to this which is slightly different and maybe useful to those of us who are using it for reasons maybe other than what it was originally used for. And another, in, in a sense, Fano's inequality, I think of as kind of the perfect topic for a workshop, for a program like this, because after all, we are at the nexus of information and computation. And as we shall see, the inequality itself in its own encoding in some way represents the nexus of both information theory and computation and gets used in that way in a number of circumstances. And of course, it, you know, it's no news to this audience and we've been seeing a number of talks on this, how you know, information flows at the heart of many of the ways we reason about computation, especially in terms of limiting how we do things with computation. Right? So you have, you know, you, if you want to say that a certain computation is hard, or is gonna take a certain amount of time, it's very hard to reason about the computation directly. So you want indirect methods and talking about information flow, saying I need at least this much information to go from A to B is a good way of limiting uh, and saying what you can and cannot do with a certain algorithm. And of course, the whole premise of streaming algorithms is based on this idea of communication complexity, that you want to limit the power, you want to say how much, how much memory you need in a streaming algorithm, and so you say there's a communication between the first part and the second part, and then we have this whole sort of industry of how to understand communication complexity. So this is something that's, that's sort of very, very classical and very well known. And so, in some sense, I, the way I think of at least Fano's inequality is a, is a is part of a long line of ways of reasoning about how information theory gets used in computation. And so in order to get to that point, at least the, the journey that I sort of went on to help me understand how its context is sort of the journey I want to take you on, which again, will start off with things that you're all very, very excruciatingly familiar with and will seem very sort of you know, basic to begin with, but hopefully as we build up, you'll see the connection and it'll sort of, at least in my mind, it helps me fix exactly what's going on. And I should say that, you know, this is a three-hour tutorial. I have no, I make no promises that will last entirely the three hours. I mean, um, there's a lot of things you can say about Fano's inequality, and you know, there are a lot of things you could go on for a while about. But I think to capture the main points, um, we'll see how long it takes. You know, and uh, so feel free to interrupt with questions and uh, discussion and debate and argument, and that's all good too. Because as we all know, interactive proofs are exponentially more powerful than a monologue. So, so. <laughs> all right. So, so let's. Uh, we're going to start with something. You know something more natural, since we're all sitting in the room, we should probably go outside even though it's cold. We'll start with some pigeons. In particular, we'll start with the pigeonhole principle. Right? And so I should say, this is a, I should mention, before I start, a bit of an outline. This is a, a three-part lecture in four parts. So part one is going to be, um, uh, so part one will be sort of basics. So from pigeon Stefano, per se. Uh, part two, I'll work on some examples. So non-trivial, so at least two examples that I want to talk about that sort of illustrate how it gets used in different contexts in different ways. Um, in part three, I want to show how there's a nice geometric perspective on Fano's inequality, which is underlying, which underlies the heart of how it works. And um, for those who know me, you'll know that I, I insist on putting geometry inside everything, so this is a, makes me very happy. And then the fourth part I want to talk about is a little bit more 
um, not as well fleshed out, but it's an interesting direction of, of the use of funnels and equality and beyond uh, in machine learning. Okay, So hopefully over the course of these uh, three units we'll cover all of this and have time for discussion as well. So pigeons, right? So we all know the pigeonhole principle. Pigeons in n minus one holes, some hole has uh, two pigeons, or right? Nothing particularly surprising about this. This is one of the most basic sort of tools we use. If you teach an undergrad class in algorithms, you might introduce this at some point, and you know people will laugh, and you'll say, explain to them how useful it is, and they won't believe you, but in fact it is. And um, what I, I'm not, you know, what I want to say is that if you take this very, very simple thing, right, you can think of it as in, at least I like to think about it as in two different ways. And I'm deliberately going to present these two different ways because I think that'll be helpful when we actually get to funnels inequality. Okay. And so the first view of this, I'm going to call the decoding view. Okay. And what I mean by this is the following. The pigeonhole principle tells you that if you try to store n plus one things in n bins, you're going to make a mistake on two things. In other words, if you now ask, is item i in the bin, there's going to be some pair of items where you're going to make a mistake in your decoding of the data structure. right? So this is what I call the decoding view of the pigeonhole principle. You just make this mistake. The other view of the pigeonhole principle, you can think of it as a space view, right? which is in many ways the more commonly used view of this, that if you need to store n things, you need n cells. Okay? So you need OK? So nothing, nothing particularly, really particularly clever here. And, and of course, the beauty in the pigeonhole principle is that is in this sort of thing about the sum. There's no, you're not doing this constructively. If you're going to use the pigeonhole principle in an argument, it is, you know, all, or more often not going to be an existential argument. You're going to say, okay, there's going to be some collision somewhere. You're not actually going to necessarily going to go and find it. In fact, you often use the pigeonhole principle in places where your space is very big. So you're not actually looking for the collision. You just want to know that some collision must exist. So it's existential. It doesn't care about the function. It's completely information theoretic in that sense, right? And that's sort of a nice thing about it. In fact, you know, there's a whole class of problems that are called essentially pigeonhole principle complete, right? That where you know that there exists a solution by the pigeonhole principle, but the hard part is finding one. And we don't know where this class exists in polynomial time. So this class is called PPP. It contains PPAD and it has other nice properties. So it, it, you know, so this is definitely an existential result in that kind. Um, and of course, we can use the pigeonhole principle to provide lower bounds for problems. In, in particular, the second view, the view of space. And um, just again, to go over a simple example, just to warm up, um, there's this classic example in uh, communication complexity, this sort of problem of disjointness that we've heard about, that uh, Chin talked about, and the doctor about. And you want to, you have two players, you have Alice and you have Bob, and they have n bit strings, and um, you want to know if they're disjoint or not. Right? So you each, each n bit string is representing some subset of one through n, and the question is, is x intersection y um, empty or not? Okay. And of course, we you know let's let's we're do, you know there's a lot of technology in this. I'm not even going to go into all the, all the fancy ways you can prove this lower prove a lower bond on this problem and the amount of communication needed. I'm just going to do something very very simple. Right? Just look at a simple deterministic strategy. Not even look at anything fancy and randomized. Right. And of course, this obvious solution is send x over to y, and you get the answer. It's all good. But can you do any better? And so what you want to show is that, no, if you have a deterministic algorithm, you cannot do any better than this. And you want to show it just by using the pigeonhole principle. And it's very simple. You just say, look, if, if Alice could send some number of bits over to Bob, so suppose Alice sends some number of bits over to Bob, um, that and b is less than n, right? then by the pigeonhole principle, 
there must be two inputs. So there must be, there exists some x1 and x2 that both map to, um, sorry, where's my eraser? Such that if, if Alice is running whatever function she's running, she's running some function to generate the message she's sending to Bob, and this is going to be true. You're going to have a collision because of the Prisional principle. And of course, you know, all you have to do is make sure that suppose x1 and x2 differ on bit, let's say i, then make sure that y's input, set y is equal to zero, all zeros and a one in the ith input and all zeros, then b will have to make a mistake on one of these two things because they won't know the difference between them. Right? So again, a very simple argument. There's way more complicated arguments you can give for lower bonds in a much stronger settings. But the point I want to make is not that. The point is that the pigeonhole principle is a way to prove lower bonds on space because of this argument like this and doesn't care about how you do the mapping. That's where the power comes from. Okay? All right, good. So you very quickly, yeah. Ah, good. Yes. And from the answer to that, I know whether Alice has Absolutely. That's right. And that's very good. Thank you. Because you can, you can view this in either form you want. You can take it as a space view, which I think, is, at least to me, it seems like the more natural. Or you can take the decoding view, which is exactly the same in this case. Very good. Thank you. And of course, once you have the pigeonhole principle, it's not doesn't take too much time to get to entropy, right? So we know that you know, if you have a, a k bit number expresses two to the k outcomes, right? So this we know, fine. And um, of course, just applying the pigeonhole principle directly means that you need at least um, log n bits to represent n outcomes, right? This comes directly from that. For the obvious reason, you can prove it, not very hard. And um, so again, you can say that you need, so what we're doing here now is not storing things. We're saying that we're coming up with an encoding of an object, right? We have these n outcomes. We want to come up with an encoding. And the encoding requires at least log n bits. Because if you didn't use log n bits, you would not be able to decode properly. And that's the crux here, right? That you have these n outcomes. They go into some kind of encoding apparatus that gives you log n bits. And then you decode it. And you have to have this much in order to get this out. Right? And think of this as your some kind of channel. Okay? All right. The nice thing about this reformulation, even though I haven't, again, I still have not actually done anything, I'm just playing with words here, is that we've gone from an actual explicit storage mechanism with collisions, but we're just talking about an encoding now. Right? I'm just talking about bits. And once I get to encodings and bits, I can now open up my world to a much more general setting where I can do all kinds of things. Um, moreover, the, um, this argument here, the pigeonhole principle with the Alice and Bob, was essentially a one round argument. Right? Alice sends a message over to Bob, and then you're done. Right? The, this, the, the, so the simplistic reasoning here doesn't get you anywhere if you say, well, maybe they talk to each other for a while. Right? But when you're thinking about bits, it's a bit easier to think, reason about multi-round encodings, because I'm saying, no matter what I do in the multiple rounds, I look at all the bits I've sent over, that has to somehow be the encoding here. So it allows you to a bit more generality in how you make these arguments. Okay? And of course, the, um, the classic example, which I'm going to do, which again is sort of probably obvious to all of you, uh, but it's just helpful to sort of think through what's going on here. Think like sorting, right? So we know that we want to, that sorting has this lower bound of n log n for the number of comparisons. And the reason it has this lower bound is because you can think of sorting as doing a permutation computation, right? If you think of the process of doing sorting, you go from any input to a sorted output, and then conversely, you can think of the inverse permutation as saying, I'm just computing any permutation of the input. So I want to be able to express all possible permutations of the input in my computation. Well, I can write down all possible permutations of the input. There are n factorial of them, right? So I know that. And so I need, it, it does, I will need some more n log n bits to encode this set of permutations, right? I need n log n bits. So that just again by the, by, by the entropy argument. So you need log of this, which is n log n for all permutations. 
But now I have some kind of decision procedure. I have a decision tree, right? I have some kind of comparison-based model. And what is the comparison-based model doing? It's basically saying, okay, I have this comparison. I can, I can decide at every step whether I should go right or left. And I have some kind of binary tree built on these leaves. And of course, a binary tree with a certain number of leaves needs at least log of that depth height. So the height of this tree is again going to be log of n factorial, which is n log n. And again, while this is again something that we see in undergrad algorithms class, the point here is that once you move to this encoding view, you can now think of this process as stripping off bits by bits. At every step, you extract a few bits, extract, extract a few more bits, and a few more bits, and a few more bits. At the end, you've essentially specified the entire permutation. You don't have to think of it that way, but you could. You could think of this as just getting a few number of bits in every round. Right? And so that's, again, sort of a standard way to think about this. And of course, we can generalize this bound even further. Right? There's nothing special about log of n. Right? Log of n, in some sense, is an artifact of the fact that you're treating all these items equally. And if you didn't treat them all equally, it's a bit of a waste. Right? If I have a few items, I'm saying that I need log n bits to store n items, but maybe half of them never show up except once in a blue moon. And so it seems a pity that I'm wasting that extra bit to store those half items and I didn't really need them. And of course, that gets to this notion of entropy-based lower bounds. Right? So I say, look, I have n items. I have 1 to n. Each has a probability of occurrence pi. And so I know, just by some basic Shannon's theorem, that if I want to store this, right, on average, the number of bits I'm going to need is going to be h, let's say, let's call it h of p, which is equal to sigma of pi log 1 over pi. All right. OK? And again, this is, this, of course, a Shannon's theorem. So, and so the, the, the argument that goes through all of these, if you try to use them to prove lower bounds of any kind, is to say, look, we are going to construct some object that is related to our computation. That object is going to be either many in number or have high entropy in some sense. Right? It's going to have a high entropy as given by this expression. And because it has a high entropy, in order to maintain it in some reasonable form, you need a certain number of bits. Right? Again, I don't care what I'm going to do with it or how I generate it. It doesn't matter. And that's the essence of the argument. And that's sort of the, the precursor, if you wish. Right? So the, the, everything that we've already seen so far, and this is sort of very familiar to us, and we use this sort of unconsciously in all our work. And not that I expect any, but if you have any questions or interruptions, please feel free. So, OK. So where does Fano come in? And the way that one way to think about Fano is that it's kind of a robust version of an entropy argument. In this following sense, that the pigeonhole principle and entropy-based arguments are what I'll call exact results. What they're saying is that if you want perfect reconstruction, this is what you have to do. If you don't do this, there will be a problem. Okay? And Fano's inequality comes in when you say, well, yes, I know there'll be a problem, but you know, how bad of a problem will it be? Maybe it's catastrophically bad if you lose one bit. Maybe it's only slightly bad. Maybe I can manage. You know, it's okay. I can sort of, you know, we, we live in an approximation world, big data, blah, blah, blah. It's fine. Can you do anything? You know, can, is there a nice spectrum? Is it, is it, or is it just a, a zero, one kind of thing? And that's the answer to which, that's the answer that Fano's inequality is giving you. Okay? And that's the way to think about how it generalizes the OK, so, so let's see. So think, if you will, of a, um, we don't need this anymore. Think, if you will, of some kind of encoding and decoding process. OK, so we have some source some x, we'll think of x as a random variable, okay? And there's some process by which it becomes y. You can think of this as building a data structure or doing some indexing or whatever, something like that. And then once you have y, your decoding process, you can, okay, I'm gonna put like a little channel marker here, so it comes up here. And then there's some kind of decoding process that gives you what you think x was. Call this x hat. Okay. So think of this as a general process like this. And um, obviously, what you want is that x hat is equal to x. 
And that's what you, that's your, your data structure, you want to have perfect fidelity, so it does this. And now we're talking about a situation where this does not happen. Okay? So, so what happens now? So, so clearly, you know, all our regular encodings fall in this framework. It's very simple. Y is just X itself, and you just do it. So here's what Fano's inequality says. At least one version of it. There are different versions of it. So, so suppose you have an X that is some random variable, um, and it takes values in some kind of finite range. So X is, some, is distributed over some finite range here. Right? There's some distribution over X. Okay, and um, let PE is the probability of error. So the probability that X hat is not equal to X. So this is not a probability over some randomized algorithm, by the way. This is a deterministic procedure. This is a randomness is over the source X and Y. Okay, so there's some probability that X hat is not equal to X. Okay. Sorry? The encoding itself is probabilistic. So there's a, so Y has some stochastic relationship with X. It's not deterministic, yeah. Um, then, and let's define H of X as the binary uh, entropy. So that's basically um, uh, X log. 1 over x plus 1 minus x log 1 over 1 minus x, right? The binary entropy here. Then the inequality says that I think there's a sometimes there's a minus 1 here, but I'll, you know. Okay. This, at least in one form, is Fano's inequality. And what I'm going to do, of course, is sort of parse this out a little bit. Right? But this is what I want to state here. And just before I go on, just want to make sure the terms are all well defined. Everything is clear. So there are, you know, many, 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 many proofs of Fano's inequality. It's actually not that hard to prove. You can do it sort of algebraically. You just have to take a certain um, expectation in two different ways and equate them, and you get the answer. It's all instant cover in Thomas. You can find countless versions of the web. So the proof is not hard. It's like probably, you know, maybe this much proof. That's all it takes. Oh, I haven't defined conditional entropy. Sorry. So the, this is a conditional entropy. Um, let me see. So should I, should I define the conditional entropy? Is that well defined? Anyone? OK, so these are things I assume that, OK. So the conditional entropy of x given y, this is why I don't want to define it, because I'll, I'm sure I'll write it wrong somehow in the summation. So <laughs> um, let's see. The conditional entropy of x given y is the expect, you can think of this as the expected value of the conditional probability of x given y. Uh, with the expectation taken over um, x, I think. Is that x? I think it's x, yeah. Okay. Over y? Yeah, it should be over y, right? Yeah, yeah, it should be over y. That's basically what it is. Okay. Oh, sorry. No, no. The expected value of log of p. Yeah. Sorry? Ah. Yeah, so it's probably cleaner to take the expectation of one over, log of 1 over p, right? So yeah, so let me just rewrite this. That's why I want to write this up. So um, OK, so the expect, it's the expectation of log 1 over p uh, x given y uh, with the expectation taken over both x and y. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. OK? All right. In some sense, and again, the intuitive way of thinking about conditional entropy is that once I give you y, how much uncertainty is left in x? If y, in fact, was a deterministic function of x, this would be 0. OK, thank you. So 
there will be a, a, I will modify this into a form which may have a little bit more intuition to it. So, but, but anyway. So like I said, there are many proofs of this inequality, and they're not you know, hard to do. Uh, but I think there is a way to think about how these terms show up, which for me at least is a little bit more instructive, and tries to reinforce this whole encoding, decoding idea that's going on, which in fact is how this inequality often gets used. So one of the things that's made it was hard for me when I was first reading about Fano's inequality is that I kept seeing the, the shadow of Fano's inequality pop up in many papers that I was reading in, in computer science. And, this, of course, is a sign that you're obsessed with something, but that's another story. But in fact, it was showing up in these papers. It's just that the authors had essentially reinvented the proof without necessarily saying they were using Fano's inequality. And again, I, you know, there are many reasons why people sort of, you know, they just, re they just proved it themselves, and then maybe the connection was not obvious till later. But I think that that, and that particular process is what I want to bring out here, because it's a, it's a tool that shows up a lot. And in fact, Casper will, Casper Larson next week will talk more about this idea and things beyond it in his, uh, in his tutorial. So I just want to steal a bit of his thunder and tell you a little bit about here before he tells you more. OK. So how should we think about this inequality and where it comes from? Right? So let's think about this in terms of an encoding decoding operation. So of course, we are, the first step in our process is that we're encoding x into y through a channel. And this is something that we understand very well from information theory. So we can write things like the entropy in x is equal to the mutual information between x and y plus the residual leftover entropy after you've done the encoding. Right? So this is sort of a standard decomposition you can do. So this is, again, the mutual information, which, again, I will attempt to write out without people laughing at me, um, is, um, is equal to the basically the, let's see, sum over x. I'm going to use discrete things here instead of, um, uh, so, so it's the KL divergence between the, between the, from the, marginals to the joint of the marginals. So it's pxy log px, y divided by px, py. Again, if you if you so inclined, replace integrals by sums, put in your favorite measure and all the stuff. Okay. All right. So so this is we know we know how this works, right? We have a channel, we encode it, we we, we sort of understand how this thing works. What's happening next? We're using this reconstruction G. Right, to somehow make a guess, an estimate x hat of x. And the idea here, in the way the Fano's inequality comes about, is to realize that that reconstruction gives us encoding. In other words, given a reconstruction procedure G that has certain properties, you can use it to construct a direct encoding of x, a complete encoding of x, a perfect one. That's the insight. And because you can use a reconstruction to do a complete encoding, and because x has a certain amount of entropy in itself, your reconstruction must have certain properties to it. And that's how this is going to appear. Okay, So let's see what happens here. So we're going to construct a reconstruction. We're going to use the reconstruction g to construct an encoding of x. Um, how? So remember that we use this pe as the probability that you make a mistake. So suppose you are getting some x through your channel, it becomes a y, and you decode it. right? And let's say you know this is an example where you're going to make a mistake. Remember, I'm doing an encoding now. I'm, I'm looking at g, and I'm doing an encoding. g is a deterministic procedure. So let's say you have some x for which, in fact, you made a mistake. g is deterministic, yeah. yeah. So I can inspect g. right? So g is telling me, oh, I made a mistake on this particular x. It came through, and it got modified, and now I, I, I screwed up. Okay, Fine. Remember, this probability is over the inputs, not over what g is doing. So what I'm going to do is, in that case, I'm going to say, look, I messed up. I can't do any encoding here. Just take x and write it down. So you can think of my encoding of x. So if I want to write an encoding of x, I'm going to write it as y combined with a single bit that tells me if I made a mistake or not. And if I did make a mistake, it gives me the original x back again. Okay, so this, this part only exists if this part says I made a mistake. Otherwise, it doesn't exist. And this is a complete encoding of x. And now the question is, how big is this encoding? OK? Well, we know how much the encoding this is going to be. And again, this goes back to basic information theoretic arguments that the encoding needed to write down this, this part, given x, is going to need something like i, x, y bits to write this down on average. How many bits are you going to need here? Well, b is a bit that is 1 if you fail and not. 
And so PE is a probability that that bit is 1. So the um, encoding length of such a, an event with probability PE of being 1 is going to be HPE. Right? So it's going to be H. I'm going to need H of PE bits here. OK? And under the condition that you did fail, an event that happens with probability p, you have to write down x. And so you need log m bits for that. Technically, you need only log m minus 1 because you, know, you already know you made a mistake. So, but I'm going to ignore that for a second. OK? So this is the size of my encoding. But we know that the sum of these things cannot be less than the entropy of x. This is what the entropy argument tells us. The basic argument about what Shannon's theorem says. That the encoding of x has this much entropy, this has to be at least h of x. OK? Well, with this we already have. This we know. Subtract the two, and you get this. OK? So in other words, the by using the reconstruction g to create the encoding, right, and using the fact that h of x is a lower bound on how many bits we need for any encoding, we can reason that this quantity here has to be at least whatever is left over, which is the conditional entropy. So the way you do it is you, what you're saying is that I'm given this process here, right? And I want to use this g to sort of throw away all this and just write down an encoding of x, which I know will need at least h of x bits, a new kind of encoding. And so my encoding is going to look like, well, what y was giving me. But then if I made a mistake, just write down x again. <laughs> Sorry? The in Sorry, I don't understand. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but remember, I'm not okay. So that's the thing. I'm don't think of this as something that happens after I do this, right? Think of this as a separate process that's coming and in inspecting this entire pipeline and then rewriting the whole thing. So the the inspector who's doing this has access to every single bit of this pipeline, right? Yes. Ah, so you're not convinced by this part you're saying? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. I have a problem with x as well because, I mean, why do you use low band there and then later h x there? I mean, you know, you could have, instead of using low band, you could have used h of x there as well. Um, so well, why is that encoding? You know, suddenly there you are, you know, bit by bit in uniform, and then on the other side you have entropy. I could, except that the things on which I make a mistake could come from a different distribution over x. So I don't know anything about that. So that's one thing. That's one issue. The second issue is that it doesn't hurt me to do that. This could be a very bad bound, right? I mean, just to answer that point. I mean, I'll get back to the point. It, no, in other words, it does, I mean, what I mean is this could be a very weak argument, right? This could be a, a horribly bad encoding, is what I'm trying to say. But it's, but, it, but it's not incorrect to do this. The, this part I'll address in a second, but I just want to address this point first. That's what I'm trying to argue here. Um, so back to the other part. So why is it that I can encode y using these many bits? Um, so the argument for this is If I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, is the basic property of this channel, right? Just, this goes back to the fact that I can encode this channel with that ixy encodes the capacity of this channel, the going from x to y. If I just think of this part of the process here, right? Forget about the reconstruction part, right? That 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 um, ixy is basically the the capacity of this channel, and is the num is the number of bits I need once I you know. Uh, it captures the correlation with x and y, essentially. I'm sorry, to start with, it's not capacity. Capacity is equal, but that's a mathematical theorem. 
Yeah. The maximum of mutual information. Mutual information is a fixed task. It's yes. Right, sorry, so I shouldn't use the word capacity, but, but, but I mean, yeah, right, right, right. It, it is, but, but the mutual information is the, is, the mac, is, the, is the maximum, basically, capacity of this channel it has, right? I mean, that's what, you're, that's, what you're, that's what the result says, right? So, and that's what I'm saying. So you can, that's the number of bits you, um, ah, so you're saying that I could use very fewer bits. You don't need to use that many bits, you're saying. I think that's what your argument. No, I just said that yeah. it's not capacity. That, I agree. So the argument, I think, for this, um, and, I, and I think this is in some sense, and it, you're right, is it in some sense an intuitive argument, is that, um, at least the way I've also always thought about this is that if you think of the encoding of y given x, not given y, so the, or the amount of information between x and y, this is the way to capture the number of bits. And this is um, possibly a little bit, but. Um, Pardon me? I have a bit sequence of the size, what's very Right. Okay. Yeah. Is you got a question? Right. Well, which is why this is. These are all sort of the. This is the uh, the on average number of bits you need, right? Because I'm comparing this to the average number of bits in the encoding of x. So the, all of this is happening on average. That's why I have an on average terms here as well. Yeah. While we're complaining, so, uh, Sorry? While we're complaining, yes, yes, good, good, good. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, so it's, it's a very nice way of, it's a very nice mnemonic, right? So, I, I yes. Mm -hmm. But for example, it would even greater than RT, even if GN is, uh, is randomized, uh, even then, that's what the quality works. Yes. Would you need Fano just to argue that the source can be compressed to H of X? Can't you just use Shannon's theorem for that? I mean. Uh, so, so Shannon, well, one proof of the converse of Shannon's theorem goes via Fano's. Okay. Uh, potentially other ways, but. Yeah. <laughs> right. So yeah, I think, and I, and I, I like I uh, yeah, maybe I should have not claimed this as so much as a, as a proof, it leaves some certain issues to be desired. But it's, as you said, that's a good phrase. I think it's a good mnemonic to sort of think about how these terms are showing up, okay? And one, I think another way to reinterpret this inequality, right, which becomes a little bit easier to parse, at least in one's head, is to simplify it a little bit. And this brings in, again, the notion of mutual information, which is a bit easier to work with. So, so let me do the following. Um, okay. What I really want to do, what I, my goal here, is to somehow relate P, the probability of error here, to some notion of the relationship between X and Y. Okay. And there is a relationship here, but it's not as easy to see. At least you have to sort of parse these log terms here. So let's simplify this a little bit by saying that, let's assume that, that x is drawn uniformly from 1 to n. Okay? So h of x is log n, basically. Okay? Um, so in that case, you can write h of x um, is, well, you can say that, sorry, that log of n, because uniform, is equal to i x y plus h of x given y. And you can actually replace h of x given y by i x y, which we'll do in a second here. Okay? And then once you do some algebra and simplify this whole expression, and you note that h of p will be less than or equal to um, uh, log 2, okay? You can simplify this whole expression to get P of E 
is greater than or equal to 1 minus i x y plus log 2 divided by log m. Okay. And so this again a sort of an alternate way of thinking about Fano's inequality but in a slightly you know, different form. And why this particular form is useful is because it directly shows you this trade-off between these two entities. Namely, if you have a reconstruction that is very accurate, which means this number is small, then this number is going to be big. If you have a setting where this number is very small, right, then this number is going to be very big. And it's the use of these two ways of thinking about how these things interplay brings up the two, at least the two different ways I've seen the use of Fano's inequality in different settings. For 10 minutes, okay. Okay, so again, so we're taking this inequality here and we're sort of transforming it into this form here. Yes. Um, because it's, um, you just have to, you know, because P, just, you just simplify this expression here. No, 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 you can, for, I mean, P is less than, the ma what's the maximum value of the entropy? It's when P is half, right? So just, yeah, yeah, sorry. Ah, so it should be, well, yeah, right, 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 right. So I mean, P is set P equal to half, right? That's the maximum value. So it should be just log two, I guess, right? Yeah, so depending on, did I use, yeah, I use log, okay, I should use log. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, one, yeah. Right. Okay, all right. So, questions, more questions, more complaints, more grumbling. Yeah. All right. So we have about 10 minutes left, but I'll let me start anyway, and then we can just continue on to the next one. So let me start off with the perspective that shows up or has been showing up in data structures in, in computer science for a bit. And let's look at this inequality again. Like I said, you can think of these two quantities as sort of going, you know, as con being controlled by each other in some way, right? And I should mention though there are examples that show that this is tight. So this, this form is actually the best you're going to get. There are some constructions to that, so. Yes, right, right, yeah, 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 that's right, that's right, Put it. yeah, then it's, yeah, 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 no, you're right, you're right, you're right. Mm -hmm. Because basically it's m minus one, because if you made a mistake, you know it's not the one you got, so you only have to worry about writing out encoding of m minus one things, because it's not, you know it's a mistake, that's what. Okay. And that's also the important in decision procedures where n is two, so that number actually vanishes. Right, and so you can't, use, in certain cases you can't, use, yeah, right. Right, in fact, when I talk about classification, this actually shows that this disappears, you're right. So what you had before is still correct. Yes, yeah, mm. yeah, this is crude, yeah. Mm. Okay, so think of x as some input to your problem, and y is some kind of data structure. So you have x, which is your, let's say, a bunch of points, and you have y, which is some kind of data structure you're building over x. Maybe you're building a nearest neighbor data structure, maybe you're doing something else, whatever. And the goal, of course, is to use y to get some information about x. You may get some queries coming in, who's my nearest neighbor, and you want to answer these queries. Okay. And suppose I can build such a structure to do this reconstruction, to actually get my answers well. So I have, a, uh, I have an algorithm that works with a reasonable probability of success. In other words, PE, if you think of in this context, is small. If PE is small, then this number must be large the mutual information between x and y must be large. And then you can use that to show that the size of this data structure must be big. Okay? And that is essentially how Fano's inequality gets used when you're proving these uh, data structure lower bonds, whether it's cell probe lower bonds or in the example I'm gonna give you a dimensional reduction lower bond. Namely, you show that there's some, pr that if you have a process that reconstructs reasonably well, or you can construct a process that reconstructs reasonably well from this data structure, it has to have a sufficient amount of information in it, precisely given by this, and then you can conclude it must be at least a certain size. Okay? There is again a, so the dual form of this, where you, 
you fix this and you look at that, and that gives you these um, minimax estimation, which I'll talk about next. But this is the first example that I want to talk about. And again, none of these examples are easy. They're not you know, turnkey where you sort of apply it and it just works. It's much more buried in the thickets of an actual problem. So when I was thinking about how to give an example of how this works, I had to look through a number of different cases. And again, all of them have a lot of other machinery associated with them. This is example is what I thought was relatively clean. It still has some machinery that I will try to parcel out and keep hidden so I can show you exactly how Fano's inequality is being introduced into the problem. OK? All right. So this is what I'll call the version, sort of the data structure, sort of this lower bounds version of the, of the use of the key. Lower bounds on space. And so, you know, versions of this idea have appeared. So the paper I'm going to talk to you, this is a paper by Oded Regev on dimensional reduction L1. Versions have appeared in a paper by um, Panigrahi, Talwar, and Weeder on nearest neighbor search. It's a paper that we wrote, sort of on a, a different version of nearest neighbor search. Casper uh, has written a couple of papers using this technique, or version, uh, this technique and things beyond it. And he'll talk about them next week as well. Um, again, so they've appeared in many different settings, again, in disguise. And so I just want to bring it out right here. OK, OK. So, so the problem I want to talk about is dimensionality reduction. And this is a paper by Oded Regev. I think it's from 2005, if I'm not mistaken. And it's a very nice uh, thing about, well, I mean. So the, here's the problem. So I have a bunch of, and this is in L1. Okay. So the problem is the following. I have a bunch of points, and they're lying in some L1 space. Right? So remember L1, um, the L1 norm of a point is equal to sigma pi. Uh, let's say these are d dimensions, or in general also, you can, if you replace by integral. So I have some set of points. So I've given n points, p1 to pn, that lie in some L1 space. Okay? And the goal is to embed them in another L1 space of small dimensionality. So I want some mapping. So I want some mapping f that goes from the L1 space to some L1 space with dimensionality d, where d is, we'll consider small. And we'll explain what small means. So that all distances, and the embedding should be such that all distances are approximately preserved. And what I mean by that is that if I look at the distance between two points in the original space, and I look at the distance between two points in the embedded space, right? These are within some, say, one plus epsilon factor of each other. So this is at most one plus epsilon times that, or that's, okay? So we'll call this an epsilon approximate embedding. Now, these things are very important. There's this whole theory of metric embeddings that I will not get into here, but these things are important because a lot of times, you, if you, I mean, uh, as we've you know, known for a while, if you could take a, there's a lot of problems in graphs, for example, you can embed them into L1, then you can solve them sort of in some way that you can get a good, good approximation guarantee for them. And um, if you can reduce the dimensionality of a space, of course, then there are things you can do in a lower dimensional space that are much easier to do because of the curse of dimensionality and so on. What's also we, what also we know is that for if you replace L1 by L2, then this is actually doable. This is, of course, the famous johnson lindenstrauss lemma that says that any set of points in L2 space can be embedded in L2 space of dimension d, where, so for L2, you can do this with d is equal to something like log n over epsilon squared. Okay? So very small. This is what I mean by small. Much, much smaller than n. And so the question for a long time was, can you do the same thing for L1? And so it's, it was, you know, people showed in many forms that no, in fact, you cannot do this. There were lower bounds that were given for L1, first for certain kinds of embeddings, and then in general for, other, for arbitrary embeddings. And um, this paper is not the first paper to show such an embedding lower bound, uh, but it's one that unifies lower bounds for distortions that were small and large and sort of put them in a nice context. And along the way, what he did was basically show, use Fano's inequality to prove this lower bound. So is the, um, how many minutes do I have?
time to break. Okay, so before we stop, this is the problem that we want to examine in the context of using funnels inequality for a data structure lower bound. Uh, if, you have, if you have any questions, then we can take a break and we can come back and look at it. Okay, all right, so we'll continue in, I guess, 15 minutes or so? Yeah, okay, minutes. yeah, thanks. Yeah.